many times I will start on the Bible study for uh, the coming Wednesday on Sunday night after church, and then I'll work on it on Monday, and then I try and finish it up no later than by uh, Tuesday to get it mailed in to the secretaries so that they can be able to put together the outline that you have in your lap. You'll notice that the, the last portion of the outline is extensive because I wasn't really sure if I would be able to cover everything. I would cover as much as I can, but that's why I gave you a wholesome outline tonight towards the end of it to make sure that you'd be able to have all of it that I studied. Uh, you'll see here that we're talking about how to develop a good spirit in my child. We was reading a few moments ago, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14, I'll pick up right where I started and I'll continue to read. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14, the Bible says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Uh, let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player of the harp, that he should come, uh, that it should come to pass, that when the evil spirit of God is upon thee, that he shall play uh, with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Now, they knew that, by the way, this was a temporary Band-Aid. Uh, they knew that, uh, that he was going to come in and he was going to play the harp, and then that evil spirit would flee. But it also does show us that music has a bearing on a person's spirit. Uh, you can play uh, the wrong type of music, and it's going to have a wrong type of bearing on a person's spirit. You can pray, play the right type of music, and it's going to have a bearing on a person's spirit. First Samuel chapter 16 and verse 17, the Bible says, And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. So he was very, very despondent. Uh, to that which is God. Uh, his spirit was not right. He wanted help. Many times a person that wants help will grasp for straws, and so is Saul. The Bible says, And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took, the, took an harp, the Bible says, and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and, 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 and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So notice that Saul in these verses uh, had a bad spirit. He had a despondent spirit. David comes, David plays the harp, and then of course that bad spirit goes away. Again, this is a temporary solution uh, to a major problem that Saul had. Matter of fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 10, the Bible says, uh, and it came to pass. Okay, now by the way, this is after 1 Samuel chapter 16, so it's happening Again, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. Oh, watch it. Here it is in 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 9. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. So here he is. Uh, he has a wrong spirit, a despondent spirit. If you would please, a lack of the uh, of, uh, of the fullness of spirit uh, that was available to them in that day. Complacency had set in, if you would please, as a substitute for God working in his life. So David comes, David plays the harp, uh, he amused that which was Saul, and so now you'll see that everything is okay for a while. By the way, there's people that practice that today. The word muse means to think. Uh, and when you put uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, letter A in front of it to amuse or like an amusement uh, park uh, you fill your mind with other things and I see people that do that I see people that uh, uh, you know they should be considering deeply what can I do to get this uh, a rotten feeling what can I do to get this despondent feeling what can I do to get this evil uh, feeling that I have what can I do to rid this from me completely and so what they do is they say well I tell you what I don't know what to do so I'm going to go to Disney World I don't know what to do, so I'm going to go to Six Flags over, uh, over Texas. I don't know what to do, so I'm going to take a vacation. And what they try and do is they try and fill it with things. Uh, it's the Band-Aid. Uh, try and fill it with things that would take care of that. You know, we as parents, we have to watch our children's spirits. 
Uh, it's very good to watch what their spirit is like. Uh, are they uh, the type of person that's sort of uh, wrapped up in their own uh, cocoon? I mean, are they uh, trying to be self-sufficient within themselves? You know, the average child uh, almost is like, uh, you know, a poly parrot, if you will. Uh, you know, they, what they see in the home, what they hear in the home is what they're going to be. You know, uh, somebody said this, that your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. What's that mean? Well, people follow you more than they listen to you. Uh, you know, I, I know uh, people I'm counseling right now. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the husband and wife, they're always yelling each other. They're always frustrated with each other. They're always uh, displaying their emotions towards each other. And, and in each one of those given situations, that's the word you learn that. Here's what each one of them has said, bar none. They said, we learned that from our parents. You know, so our children learn how to respond or not to respond by the way that we are in the home. The average home is not filled with laughter. It's not filled with joy. Uh, it's not filled, if you would please, with the right type of things. And then we wonder why many times our children uh, wind up having trouble. Uh, somebody said this, that familiarity breeds content. Then say contentment. It says contempt. All right? And so as a person becomes familiar with somebody, unless that relationship goes deeper, people that have a deep relationship with God it's easy for them to give, to give grace. It's easy for them to give forgiveness. It's easy for them not to have their pillars shook where they become emotionally entangled with their spouse or with their children so that they lose control. So when a bad spirit is dominating the home, it shows the absence of the power of the Holy Spirit. So what do we do to be able to get the Holy Spirit in control? Statement number one, confront sin confront sin. Now that means parents, we have to confront sin in our own lives. Confront sin. Uh, when, uh, uh, when we ourselves commit sin, we need to agree with God against our sin in order to be able to get right. Uh, number two, forsake sin. Uh, by the way, uh, when a child does wrong, help them to see that it's sinful. Help them to see that they need to forsake it. The Bible says, he that confesseth and forsaketh shall find mercy. So if they want to find mercy, that is God withholding judgment. Then we need to teach them to do two things with sin. And the only two things sin is worth is to confess it and then also forsake it. Now that means what? That means you're going to have to sit down with your child creatively and talk with your child and help your child to see that sin is sin and sin is bad. You're going to have to sit down and talk with them. You're going to have to reason with them. You're going to have to help them to understand. Don't just passively, when your child is young, say, oh, they're just being a child. Well, I've seen good children and they're just being a child. I've seen children that are bad children. <laughs> they're still just being a child. Uh, I, I think you ought to train your child. Uh, now, how do you do that? Well, uh, teach them what sin is and help them to understand. By the way, uh, as you confront sin in your life and they see that you're broken over sin, don't forget, many times more than not, they follow your pattern. They follow your pattern. Uh, one of the kids told me the other week, they said, you know, one thing I've always appreciated about mom. I said, tell me, what have you always appreciated about mom? Every morning, uh, all the way back to when I could remember, she's always gotten up and she's always read her Bible in a certain place. And dad, that has meant so much to me to have a mother that now we were taking, we, we were just talking about, uh, I, I asked my, uh, my boys, I said, what do you appreciate so much about your mother? I'm just curious. What, what is it that stands out in your head? What is it that stands out in your head? And I thought they'd say, man, she cooks like an ace. I, I thought they'd say, man, she, she play, when she plays games, she gets in it. She is in it to win it. Uh, but no, it was... Uh, saw her reading her Bible in the morning. That had the biggest impression on me. I saw when she was brokenhearted and she prayed earnestly. 
okay? Uh, the young people uh, will copy what they see. And, of course, we homeschooled all those many years, and they saw her uh, in the morning time before school started, uh, giving the devotions to them as I was out and already gone and praying with them. You know, I mean, that has an impression. Confront sin. How do you do that? Well, you confess sin. How do you do that? Well, you forsake sin. Oh, what do you do? You replace the bad with good. Replace the bad with good. Uh, they have bad friends replace them with good friends. Uh, they have bad music uh, that is causing their spirit to dwarf. Uh, what do you do? You replace it with good music. Uh, they have bad television watching habits. What do you do? You replace it with good habits. Uh, they read bad literature. What do you do? You replace it with good literature. Okay? Uh, what you put in is going to come out. If you don't put nothing in, nothing comes out. I think that's what's wrong with a lot of our society. There's nothing to come out, okay? But you got to put the right things in. You have to spend time putting the right things in. Uh, so, number one, you confront sin. Number two, uh, realize that rebellion was the first sin. Rebellion was the first sin. So, rebellion really is disobedience. Uh, the opposite of rebellion is obedience, so the opposite of rebellion is obedience. So we want to teach our children to be obedient. Obedience is uh, an attribute, if you would please, that we instill inside of our children so that it helps to combat that which is rebellion. You know, and that, by the way, um, all your children, no matter how many you have, how few you have, uh, all children at one time or another is going to go through a time of rebellion. Now, it might be minuscule, or it might be World War III, but they're all going to go through some type of rebellion. So how do you know that? Because they have a flesh. I mean, have you ever walked in the flesh one day in your life where you said something you should not have said? Have you ever walked in the flesh one day in your life when you erupted in a way that you should not erupt? Okay, well, don't expect your child to be more filled with the Spirit of God than you are. So they are going to go through times of uh, rebellions in their life. And by the way, when they do that, they are more of a recipient to be able to go and to embrace the works of the flesh at that time. And that's where we have to be careful. When a child begins to rebel in one area, please don't be fooled, parents. When a child begins to rebel in one area, there's other seeds of rebellion in the heart. You just don't see them yet. They're not being revealed yet. But rebellion that runs deep, uh, and by the way, most of the time, rebellion starts in the heart, and you only see what that person is wanting you to see, allowing you to see. Please don't be fooled. Uh, the, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, and now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication. You say, well, my child would never do that, but they, do they enjoy watching movies that has it? Do they enjoy reading books that have it? Do they enjoy listening to music, if you would please, that promotes it? Uh, if they're doing that now, they're showing that which is an element of the heart. Okay? All right? Adultery, fornication, un uncleanliness, lasciviousness. Uh, it goes on in verse 20. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variedness, emulations, wrath, uh, strife, seditions, heresies. Goes on. Endings, murderers, drunkenness, uh, revelings, and such like. Of which I tell you before, and I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All right? So think about this. If you want to stop the works of the flesh, then uh, in your child's life, you're going to have to stop that which is rebellion that leads to the works of the flesh. Uh, because, uh, can I, you know, here's a child that's rebelling, rebelling, rebelling. If you don't help them get a grip on that, when they become a preteen, it's not going to decrease, it's going to increase. When they become a teenager, it's not going to decrease, it's going to increase. When they become a pre-adult, when they become an adult, when they're 102 and have great-grandchildren, 
it's still going to be a problem. All right? Don't forget that in the Bible, when Paul said to flee youthful lust, he's talking to men. He's not talking to children. He's talking to men inside of a room, and he says, you need to flee youthful lust. What's he saying? He's saying the lust that you had as a youth has followed you all the way through adulthood year, and you need to be able to flee it now just like you fled it then. You're going to find this out. There's men sitting in this room tonight, and they, if they were honest, will tell you that some of the same things that uh, uh, caused them to think wickedly or to do wickedly or to uh, the same things that tempted them when they were a youth has followed of them all the way through adulthood years why because the flesh is very real okay so it takes much labor notice your notes it takes much labor uh, to live in the flesh you know the Bible calls uh, a, a life that's lived under the power of the flesh calls it rebellion uh, the Bible calls a life lived under the power of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost calls it fruit it's easier to live I believe uh, as a spirit filled life life, I believe it's harder to live a self-centered life. I believe it's harder to live a life of the flesh. You know, a wise parent uh, is going to attack that rebellion early and often. Rebellion does not go away just because a child reads their Bible. Rebellion does not just go away just because they attend Sunday school. Oh, they attend Sunday school. I've got a good kid. By your standard, not by God's standard, uh, rebellion doesn't go away just because somebody decides they're going to dress modestly or because somebody decides they're going to go soul winning. No, 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 no. Just because a child uh, wins a soul to Christ, that doesn't mean that they're spiritual. You have to make sure that you're working with them from the inside out, not the outside in. By the way, if you help them be right on the inside, eventually it does come out. It does come out. If you help them to love the Lord Jesus with all their mind and with all their soul and with all their energy, eventually it's showing up. You can't hide it. You cannot hide a light uh, on a hill uh, underneath a bush. You can't do it. It's going to come out. It's just going to come out, all right? And so we see that, uh, uh, you know, if he's, if he's being obedient in one area, it doesn't necessarily mean he's being obedient in all areas. Statement number three, never allow their physical maturity to deceive you. Uh, sometimes children grow up quick physically. I've seen 12-year-olds that are six foot tall plus, 12-year-olds. I've shaken some boys' hands when they turn 14, and their hands engulf my hands. I, I've seen guys work out. They go to weight barns, and they work out. And by the age of 12, 13, and 14, uh, they could lift the barn. I mean, they've got that, that, those muscles that they built. That doesn't mean they're spiritual. That doesn't mean, don't get mad at me, that doesn't mean they have good common sense. Okay, uh, understand here uh, that the, uh, in the Bible, you don't see the word teenager. Now, you do see the word child. You do see the word youth. Uh, you see similarities of that, which is the word adult used in correlation with the word maturity. Okay, and, and so we understand that uh, uh, as far as a teenager living, if you will, uh, that teenager is going to fall in one of those categories. Are they mature? Are they acting like an adult? Are they act? And it's hard for a teenager. A teenager is a crossbreed from one age to another age, and they're trying to figure out where they fit. One minute, they act like the child. The next minute, they act like they're an entrepreneurist, and uh, they own their own company, and, you know, they have 4,000 employees. One minute, they can budget the, 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 the checkbook. The next minute, they can't find the checkbook. And, and they go from one element to another element very quickly, and here's the problem we have as adults. They don't tell us when they're doing it. They run from one area to another area, and they don't put up the sign saying, okay, now I'm acting like a child. They don't do that. There's no warning. They don't, so, they don't say, now I'm an adult. They don't do it. It's, it's quite unfair. I, I think you ought to have two signs you carry around with you. And as, as a young person, especially as a teenager, mid-age teenager, have an adult sign. 
have a child sign. And, and when you start making childhood decisions, hold up the child sign. This is me. Man, that would help your parents tremendously. I'm not popular tonight. <laughs> Here's what we understand, okay? Just because a boy uh, can grow sideburns and look like Elvis doesn't mean that he has a lot of sense. You know, uh, you know, talk with your teenager and get a good sense of their feelings. Find out their judgments. What do you think about this? Find out what they believe. I didn't say find out what they know about the Bible because they may or may not know much. Depending on their personal walk with God, depending on how much they paid attention in preaching, depending on how much they've let you mentor them or others mentor them. Okay, but find out what their feelings are. Find out what their judgments are. Find out what their reasonings is. Okay, uh, you know, you must work harder to get to know your teenagers. Here, here's something I, I just don't understand about some parents that's trying. As your teenager gets older, in many families, the parents back away. Do you realize that when a young person becomes a teenager, they need you more, not less? Because now is when they're uh, fabricating. Now is when they're building that foundation. Now is when they're going to start to make life-changing choices in their life. And they need somebody to be able to guide them. Hey, if I was a teenager and I had a wise parent, I'd sit down with the parent and say, teach me what you know. Teach me what you know. When I was a young preacher, I found the oldest preachers that I could find that had the hand of God on them, and I spent as much time with them as I possibly could. And when I walked into their presence, I did one thing and one thing only. I asked questions. That's all I did. I didn't philosophize with them. I didn't try to educate them. I didn't try to impress them with my Bible knowledge. All I did was just ask questions. That's all I did. I took scores and scores and scores and pages and pages and pages and pages of notes from preachers that was being greatly used of God in many different areas of life. Why? Because as a young preacher, I knew nothing compared to them. And I wanted to learn from them before they went to heaven. Because once they get to heaven, they're out of my reach. I can't reach them. I was uh, preaching for Mark Maddox. His dad is the one that had a big influence. Of course, Joshua, you know, is an artist and, and had a big influence on our second son, Joshua, and, and taught him a lot about artwork. And as we would go from uh, church to church to church to church, we would find the ones that could uh, play a musical instrument better than anybody else in the church and say, would you spend time with this child? We would find one that would uh, uh, be able to lead singing better than any anybody else in the church and said could you teach some of this and or um, about artwork could you spend time with so and so one of our children this week or whatever the case may be now can I tell you that is very very important that we uh, attach our young people to those that are older uh, to be able to gain wisdom and 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 young people it's good not to be blinded by um, that which is the world or your friends thinking that just because your parent is old that they're washed up, rusted, you know, and they're just decaying because they do have wisdom. Statement number next, never allow the splitting of authorities. Never allow the splitting of authorities, okay? Splitting authorities, is a, it's a major goal of the rebellious child. Now, not the child that walks with God, not that, but, but it is a major goal of the rebellious child because they try and pit mom against dad so that they can get their way. Statement number next. However, uh, you, you ask, you know, what, what if the, uh, uh, the, the person says, what if the authority is wrong? What if my parent, I've had teenagers come to me and ask me this. They say, well, you know, my dad's not always right. My mom's not always right. So what if my parent is wrong? I always say this, well, you can pray. Matter of fact, you, you, you can sit down, uh, list out all the information you think about the subject matter, approach your dad. I know your dad is very approachable. Approach your mom. I know that your mom's very approachable. Sit down and then be able to reasonably go to your parent and be able to have an adult conversation with them but also allow them to speak truth into you. 
Just don't go persuasively all with your knowledge, but go with an open heart. And you should be asking more questions and trying to teach your parents because you're not a parent yet. All right? And so uh, in, in the case, you know, I'd so go to them quietly. Uh, don't, don't make a scene and allow them to be able to help you. Statement number next, uh, filling with the Holy Spirit. Filling with the Holy Spirit. You know, once a child learns to confess and forsake their sin, now they're in the position where they can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You know, I have preached uh, in youth camps, and I've come across nine-year-olds that I really believe are filled with God's Spirit. I mean, I've come across 10-year-olds, and I've watched them and their demeanor, and, and sometimes they have put 18-year-olds to shame because of the way that uh, uh, they're walking with God and they're diligently reading their Bible and memorizing Scripture and trying to please God. Uh, can I say that ought to be some type of goal? You know, if you want to develop a good spirit in your child, uh, then you must whet their appetite. Does not the Bible say, taste of the Lord, taste taste of the Lord and see that he is good Amen. by the way whatever you whetted your appetite for when you were a child whatever you whetted your appetite for when you were a teenager uh, uh, probably uh, still you have an appetite for that I, I know guys that were great sports advocates back here when they were youth and today if uh, if uh, they had a choice to go to this or to this they'd probably choose the sports because that's what whet their appetite years ago. And uh, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. You like cherry pie. There's an apple pie, there's a peach pie. There's a banana split. There's an, you know, and, and then there's that cherry pie. If you have whet your appetite and you just love cherry pie, can I tell you, when you go to the table, what you're going to get? It's what you whet your appetite for. Come on. We ought to whet our children's appetite for the things of God. Well, preacher, how in the world do you do that? Well, uh, trying to finish this up, make, make, make church fun. Make your home fun. Look forward yourself to preaching. Look forward to coming to church. When you tell Bible stories, as I know that many of your parents have devotions uh, with your children, act out the Bible stories, especially when they're young. Have fun with that. You know, Dad, you dress up as Joseph. You know, dress up as Moses. Oh, you say, I don't do that. Well, you're going to dress up for Halloween. You're going to go out and steal some poor kid's candy. Uh, why don't you do this? Why, why don't you act out your devotions and stuff? Make the Bible come alive. Make it come alive. Have fun. Your children will not be drawn to something in our world with the elements that we live in. They're not going to be drawn to something that is not fun. By the way, if you make the Bible fun in your house, when they come to church, they look forward to Sunday school. They look for. Don't forget that the children at church, the way they're acting, is just an extension of how they are really in the home. Well, I expect the youth department to straighten out my kid. How can they do what you failed to do? It's impossible. You know, uh, you've got more time with them. You've got more, you know, uh, if, if your child really loves God, they ought to have a great reverent respect for every Sunday school teacher that's in their position. Amen. If they don't have respect for somebody else in authority, I promise you, they don't have any respect for you behind your back. Amen. Because if they're not respecting other authorities publicly, they're just showing off how they are behind you. You're just not seeing it. May I say, make church fun. Make Sunday school fun. When you discipline a child uh, after that, uh, help them to see they can get victory. They can overcome things. You can walk beside them, and by walking beside them, you can help them to get victories in their life. You know, uh, they should have joy around you and joy around other people. Uh, you cannot fool a child. You know, a child, a child will see you. 
They see you for who you really are. You know, as a parent, here's several ways that you can check a child's spirit, and I'm done. You can check a child's spirit. Uh, are, are they right with others as well as right with you? Are they right with other? Are they right with a teacher? Are they right with a youth director? Are they right with coaches? Are they right with siblings? Are they right with others? Okay, uh, from time to time, you know, every child's going to have that problem with authority. But here's the thing: uh, if, if he cannot bounce back quickly when he has a problem with authority, then he's probably got a bad spirit. All right, so help him with his spirit. Okay, yeah, you know, here's some suggestions how you can check their spirit uh, yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and you can do this There's one preacher that has said this. I know one preacher said 12 times a day I know another preacher said four times a day uh, Here's one preacher and I forget who said this seven times a day I guess seven is the number of perfection. That's why this individual did that but yield yourself to the Spirit often inside of my Bible uh, I have a pray for the power of God. I got pray for wisdom. I, I have that on my mirror too. Why I need wisdom we we don't have it because we don't ask for it and we ought to ask the one that has the power to give it Amen. and that is God the same with the power of God so yield yourself o obey authorities in your life stir up the Holy Spirit uh, by doing something uh, for him that requires his help stir up the Holy Spirit a uh, step out by faith and say God I need you in this by the way, until you do that, you never know how he's going to supply. You never know how he's going to help you. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible says, wherefore it says, put thee in remembrance. He says, uh, wherefore it says, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting on of uh, my hands. And so he said, man, I've come to stir you up. Uh, how do you stir up the Holy Spirit? Well, here it gives an outline in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 22. What do you do? You can follow along there. I've got it in your notes. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Uh, uh, provoke all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Then I've given you a list there to be able to help, to provoke, if you would please, that which is yourself to do spiritual things. Your children would do more what you do. Somebody said that Christian life is more caught than taught. I believe that's true. You go to a restaurant, you say, okay, let's pray. It's caught more than it's taught. Uh, your children see mom and dad going forward, and they're praying all the time. I mean, at an altar, a place designed by God, as we've learned about in the Bible. It, it's caught more than it's taught. You come home and you tell your child, hey, guess what I got to do today? I got to show somebody how to be saved, and they bowed their heart, and they received Christ as Savior. It's caught more than it's taught. Uh, they see how you respond to somebody that might be slightly negative towards you. It is caught more than it's taught. You're sitting at a red light. Somebody blows the horn. They're shaking their fist, saying nasty things. Your child's looking at you. Hmm, wonder how they'll respond. It's caught more than it's taught. Help us to be the right type of people that helps our children to catch it. And they catch it more so by our examples as we walk with God. Father, help us tonight, I pray.